Hi all. In this video, we're going to introduce the Rivals topic and we're going to look at the first two main concepts that we need to be aware of. Now, the Rivals topic is very similar to the Limestone topic that we're going to do a wee bit further on in the year in that it focuses on landscape features that we find in these areas and you're expected to be able to explain how these features formed, how they came into being. Now, to start with rivers, to understand how rivers actually make landscape features, we need to understand how it is that they can shape the land. Now, with rivers, there are three main processes that we look at. So, we've got erosion, which is a river wearing away at the land. So, in terms of this image, it's the idea of the bulldozer scraping away at the land underneath it. We've got transportation, which is when the bulldozer picks up material in its bucket and it drives it down the road. And then we've got deposition, when the material gets dropped out of the bucket and laid down somewhere else. Now, in terms of erosion, we're going to start there. Uh, a river can carry out erosion in four main ways. Attrition, corrosion, hydraulic action, and chemical solution. Now, attrition is really quite straightforward. So, so attrition is when you've got two rocks, or multiple rocks, and they're going to kind of bump against each other repeatedly as they travel around through a river. They might be rolling about in the side, it might be, this might be the bed of a river, and the other rock's just kind of like bouncing off it as it travels down it. All of these little impacts result in pieces being chipped off the river, or chipped off the, the river bed, the river banks, and, and the material in the river. Now, corrosion, on the other hand, is where, again, if we imagine that this is the uh, the bed of the river, uh, this rock's kind of just moving along the bottom, it's going to push along with the water, and it's going to grind its way along. It's going to rub as it moves along. And as it does this, as it grinds and it rubs, it wears away some of the material like sandpaper. Uh, now, next, hydraulic action is a little bit different, and it's to do with the, the power of the water itself. So if we think of the banks of a river, there's going to be lots of cracks, there's going to be lots of little gaps in it. And as the water hits against these gaps and these cracks, it forces air inside. And this air exerts a lot of pressure on that crack. So as this happens again and again and again, the air makes the crack get bigger and bigger and bigger. Finally, it opens up and it breaks, and you'll have little bits of this at the bank will chip and fall off. Um, now, the next one, or the last one that we've got, if my slides will play, uh, is we've got chemical solution. Uh, and this is where just the chemicals present in a river, the, the stuff present in the water, physically dissolve small rocks and pebbles, making them smaller, and in some cases, actually kind of taking them down to the mineral level so that they're actually just carried around in a way that you couldn't actually see them in the water. Now, transportation happens in three main ways. I know it looks like there's four in this slide, but there's two of them that we kind of band together. So, first we've got suspension. Now, suspension up here is when really, really small, fine, light bits of material, so sands, silts, things like that, it's... When they are basically, they float along in the river. They are, you can still see them, you could like dip your hands into a river, pick up the material and you would be aware that it was there. But it's so small that it will float. Uh, we've got bed load transportation, which is both of these two, these two types of transportation at the bottom. This is larger pieces of material that are being moved along the river's bed. So they'll tend to spend some, if not most, of their time in contact with the river bed itself. And as you can see here, we've got two types of transportation. We've got traction, which is when they roll along and they just tumble their way. So you see these little arrows that are just going around. This is this material just being rolled along the river bed. And the other one, if the material is a little bit lighter, a little bit smaller, uh, you might find it kind of hops its way along. So you know, it gets picked up, but it's not quite small enough to just float. So it gets picked up, then it drops and it lands and it's picked up, it's dropped again, and it just bounces its way down the river bit. And we call that saltation. Now, finally, if we go back to the chemical solution style of erosion from earlier, that material that's being carried in the solution is also being transported. Now, the difference is here that this is so small that if you, you know, scoop the water up, 
and you look at it, you're not going to see the material that's being transported in solution, but it is there. It's, it's a chemical change that's happened. Uh, you know, some of the stuff on these rocks and the sand has been dissolved so much that it's now part of the water. Now, the last thing that we're going to look at is deposition. Now, what we've got on this side is, you can hopefully see, is we've got one kind of main river starting right up here at the top that's kind of splitting down into lots and lots of little tiny other rivers and it eventually makes its way out into into the sea or a lake. I'm not that sure where this picture's from. Um, and all this grey stuff you can see here, everything here and going further down this river is material that came from upstream. It's came from somewhere up here and it's been brought down and then deposited here. Now, why has that happened? Why has the river deposited material here? Now, there's two main factors that will cause a river to deposit its load. First, you're going to be looking at the actual valley itself getting flatter. The valley around it's getting flatter, and that's going to cause the river to start to drop some of the, the heavier stuff out. Why this happens is because the river's actually dropping in speed. So it's getting slower. So it's getting slower, so it can't carry the same stuff. Um, another, well, another reason that a river could get slower, and it's why down here we've got all this material, is that if a river enters a large body of, of kind of standing water, so a lake, the sea, things like that, it means that it's going to hit this kind of wall of water and then just start to drop material around it. Um, now what we can also get is if the, the river's volume, the volume of water being carried in a river drops, it'll also start to drop material. And we can see this happen, not in this image particularly, uh, but we can see this happen in arid areas and very dry areas. But as a river dries up, it starts to drop material. And again, it's linked into this lack of volume of water. It just can't carry as much. Um, now, finally, for today, we're going to look at something called the Bradshaw model. Now, this is a model that we use as a base for what a river kind of quote-unquote should look like. Um, now, the model examines what should happen as we move from the start of a river, its source, to the end of a river, its mouth. And the kind of changes we would expect to see as we go from source to mouth are, you know, average velocity will start out small and get bigger, uh, volume of water in the river, so discharge, will get small, will start small and it will get bigger. Uh, the depth of the river will get increased, so will the width. Uh, there will be more material in the river. Um, that's not actually on this diagram, but you would expect to get more material in the river. Uh, the size of the material will start big and get smaller. Same with the shape of it, it will start quite angular and blocky and get rounder. And the angle of slope will start out really steep and it will get flatter. Um, and, and this is all stuff we would expect to see. Now, key point, and I'm going to make this point again later, is this is an idealised model. This is, if everything is absolutely perfect, this is what we'll see. We will spend some time, we'll go out and we'll look at rivers, and you'll see you won't get all of these all of the time. And we'll talk about the reasons for that when we're out in the field. Now, the other thing that we get with this model is that it can split a river up into three stages, three areas. So these are called courses, and you've got the upper course, middle course, and lower course. The upper course is kind of upland streams and bums, small tight valleys, large angular loads. And the lower course is, you know, a larger lowland river. So big flat valleys, small pebbles, well-rounded ones. And the middle course is the transition between the two. Now, as I said, remember... The river in this model doesn't exist. There is no such thing as a perfect river that will perfectly conform to this model. But it's a marker we use to compare other rivers to. Okay, guys, so in this video, we've looked over a lot of things. So if you want to review it and break it down into chunks, obviously the joy of the video is you can pause it. Um, but we've looked at how rivers can erode, transport and deposit material. And we've had a brief overview of the Bradshaw model. In the next video, it'll be a shorter video, and we're going to look at our first feature, which is a V-shaped valley, and I'll catch up with you guys then.